Gerald, for the invitation and thank you to the Ishas community for do this uh, journal club uh, with you. And we we now are presenting a view of the of the machine starts uh, two weeks ago. This is the station of uh, liquid nitrogen profil. This is the Carnauba optical hatch. These are the mirrors that uh, are in installation right now for Carnauba. This is the first experimental hatch. Uh, this uh, experimental hatch is are done here in Brazil by a company that's called Biotech. And Carnauba is uh, a name of a tree <laughs> in Brazil. It's a um, Sirius has all uh, names related with nature, uh, Brazilian nature. This is the optical hatches uh, for Carnauba. This is the Sapoti uh, nanoscope station, uh, control room. Now we are viewing Caterete, that is the Sachs beam line, that could do Sachs and um, also coherent diffraction imaging. has uh, two experimental stations and a long tunnel uh, in vacuum for the detector to collect the uh, sacks. And this is the uh, first beam that are in commission. And this is Florian Menard, the leader of the Carnauba, uh, Caterite, excuse me. This is the detector, this is the Pi Mega. It's something that is developed here by the Medipix collaboration with CSR. This is a double crystal monochromator that are uh, developed here by Renan Geraldes as a comment uh, to you last time on the first serious talks. This is the EMA hatch. They are prepared to install all the, the things. This is the protein crystallography that it's named Banaka. It uh, has already a uh, first experiment uh, last week on uh, doing research on COVID. This is the Mogno beam line that is uh, devoted to imaging and tomography, X-ray tomography. The works are ongoing then this is the IP beam line. So utilities for the experiments. There is a laboratory for uh, team field preparation. Um, that, that's all. I hope you enjoy uh, our first view of the of our experimental hatch. And now let's talk about our quick X of beam line. Well, um, then I'm, I'm uh, the talk today, it's devoted to um, this quick X of beam line, and uh, it's called Quati is the uh, uh, 
a quick exit villain at Sirius. Um, we have uh, uh, more or less the position on the ring that is pointed there. And Quati is a Nashua. It's a, a little animal that perhaps you, you already see if you visit uh, uh, Cataratas Fault. And this is our team, uh, Amelie Rochette, that uh, has a had a baby uh, a few months ago, then is not uh, with us at the moment. Then we have Alexei, uh, that is the Bin Line Operation Manager, Junior, that is instrumentation specialist on me. And all this project is financed by the Ministry of Science and Innovation Communication. We have um, a strong uh, user community. I put uh, this year because it was the last year that we work uh, full year. Then uh, we have uh, more or less uh, 1,300 users in total for the machine, the old machine, the UVX. Now we have the Sirius. Uh, for that, 84% uh, are Brazilians, and uh, we have for Guinness that uh, for Egner, that uh, it's uh, around 50%. Uh, the most important one community after Brazil is uh, Argentina. And I come from there. I study there. And then Chile, uh, well, that year, Germany, Spain, UK, Peru, United States, and so on. But uh, we have a lot of people that work in and SAF. And then uh, we have uh, uh, that year 80 proposals. And um, more of the people working in uh, uh, catalysis uh, for X-ray absorption. And then we have more or less 50% uh, that, that the users that come in with uh, the necessity of perform in situ studies. And then uh, for that reason, we think in this beam line. The beamline uh, has a, an energy range that cover from titanium uh, in K up to xenon, and then in L, a more or less a uh, uh, big part of the interesting elements of the periodic table. And the main idea is that we, we will have uh, not only conventional shafts, but we have a quick excess beamline for performing situ studies. And we have a focalized beam line and, uh, with a little spot. And the main idea as uh, we have uh, this a strong community in catalysis is uh, do um, combined characterization, combined SAF with diffraction first, then Raman and infrared and also introduce uh, the technique of uh, X-ray emission spectroscopy and related techniques. Then uh, this is more or less the optical layout. We have the first mirror at 15 meters from uh, the source. It's inside the ring. Then uh, this <laughs> one decision that we take because uh, we take more photons in that way. Our mirrors are very long. It's uh, 1.2 meters and the first mirror has three, three stripes and is a, a collimating mirror, a cylindrical. Then we have uh, following uh, the beam, uh, the dual crystal monochromator that is developed here by Renan Geraldes. As comment, uh, um, I think Ricardo on last, last uh, talk at 44 meters, it's the dual crystal monochromator that have two crystals to cover the energy range that we have. And then the fo following, we have a toroidal uh, mirror for focus the beam. And we ensuring this uh, horizontal magnification two to one. For this reason, the uh, position of the mirrors uh, respect that and a vertical magnification to one-to-one. -one. With this configuration, we probably work at a fixed angle on, on the mirrors, and then we only change the stripe when we want to reject harmonics. 
the pin shape is uh, like that. At the focus, we have uh, something like uh, 14 or 10 microns. But far away from the focus, that usually people from catalysis want uh, a bigger beam to cover more, um, more sample. Or then, then we, we could reach up to five millimeters, uh, going three meters long on the focal position. This is more or less the visual of the beam line. We have the front end uh, that we have the mirror there, first optical element, then the optical hatch that has the dual crystal monochromator and the uh, focusing mirror, toroidal mirror, the transport area, then the experimental hatch and um, uh, control room for users. And this is more or less the position of the beam line and the mine parameters, we, we will reach an energy resolution to 10 minus 5, 10 minus 4. We hope to uh, have an energy scan of 50 mi uh, milliseconds per scan uh, maximum. Um, well, and sample environments that uh, furnaces, cryostats, uh, gazes principally because uh, our catalysis community is uh, very interested in that and then uh, uh, at least we will have eight lines and also we could work to higher um, pressure uh, up to 100 bars um, for hydrogen storage or uh, related things are uh, very useful um, also for industrial uh, applications. Also, we have a strong community on uh, electrochemistry, and then we will have potential start stop flow for um, homogeneous catalysis and electrochemical cells that we develop as, as well. And the schedule is to start our commissioning in October 2021, and the proposals probably in 2022. Uh, first semester. Um, why in situ studies? Well, uh, someone say that uh, I think Bruce is studying a system with one technique is equivalent to study with zero techniques and for understand catalysis we need really to uh, cover the gap and then uh, it's important to have at the same time <coughs> in the same experiment uh, um, very, uh, many techniques that give you information about different interactions, not only the local environment, oxidation state and electronic structure that we reach with X-ray absorption, but also uh, it's important to have uh, bulk phases with uh, diffraction, surface phases or smart crystallite with Raman and surface species with infrared um, product distribution with mass spectro spectrometry, uh, gas chromatography, if we want to do operand experiments. And then uh, this is very useful because you uh, measure simultaneously uh, all uh, the techniques in the sample at the same time and this uh, give you an extra information because sometimes you measure X-ray absorption in in, uh, in the synchrotron and then you go to your laboratory at the university and measure with other conditions, other oven, other um, uh, gas flow, and that makes uh, things difficult to uh, evaluate and and bring bridge the gap. Uh, for this reason, uh, in situ studies with multi-technique is something that uh, many of the beamless are, are working on that. And for complex systems like uh, cat Catalyst, uh, it's very useful to have this information. 
And then for uh, diffraction and X-ray absorption, we probably will use these detectors that are developed with this Medipix project that we are uh, joining with the CERN. It's a Pi Mega project. And we had this uh, uh, detector could reach uh, 800 kilopixels. Uh, uh, 600 frames per second, then it's a lot of, of, of uh, information and uh, high um, throughput uh, uh, data transfer. Right? There's more information in the paper there. Uh, for Raman, we probably will um, use this multi RAM F FTR spectrometer. We don't buy yet, uh, but we are analyzing that uh, with the uh, um, expected that the the action approves, and in, it's uh, something that we uh, have uh, an optical uh, installation in the experimental hatch, and then by uh, optical fiber we reach the spectrometer. And this gives you the freedom to perhaps use this spectrometer in other beam lamps as well, like diffraction, for example, that are join us uh, uh, by that is a uh, uh, beam line devoted to X-ray diffraction. And then we could have this information of the catalyst uh, working. That is something that will do Amelie. Uh, on, on her postdoc at the Samba building. And the infrared with SAS is something that starts with the Mark Newton, that uh, it's a happy researcher there. And he uh, joined these techniques uh, following examples of other beams that use already. And then uh, we probably uh, think in, in Bayer Vertex of Brooker as well. But we are looking other other possibilities, and with the reaction cell that we could perform, um, we probably be able to also install um, these with perhaps diffraction. Um, this is something that we are working at the moment, and uh, with X-ray emission spectroscopy, we have a some develops that we do already at the UVX machine. It's a von Hamels spectrometer. We choose a von Hamels uh, because the beam line is devoted to in situ studies. And we probably are able to perform a lot of things that are related with this technique as well. These are examples of things that we have already and the crystals that we have that cover more or less from iron to germanium uh, K edges. But uh, probably we, we will uh, work and uh, have uh, more, um, more elements on that uh, spectrometer. And we are thinking in that uh, right now. And um, well, other thing that we are thinking <laughs> by the COVID is the mailing samples. Um, we had some works on that on the UVX already published uh, uh, yet. And uh, the main idea is that uh, for standard experiments like transmission or fluorescence, we could send um, support uh, for the uh, users and then mount the samples, send again, and we could measure uh, and, uh, something that we are working on. Another important thing is the data treatment. And then uh, we had some years ago work with uh, Carmelo on that. Uh, principally Carmelo do all the work. I only give uh, ideas on that. <laughs> But uh, we have already something for 3D data uh, of many spectra. Um, and that is very useful because we could produce uh, something like 60 gigabytes uh, each two hours. And then 
it's a, a large amount of data that we need to treat. Um, well, thank you for your attention and special thanks to Frederico that uh, developed this chess implementation and then sort out of the LNLS to uh, the XFL in Europe. Questions? Yes, thank you. That's a, a, that's a terrific overview. Um, uh, I guess I have, a, a, I'll start with a question while, we're, while people are uh, 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 typing them in in the chat. Um, uh, if you can go back to your XES spectrometer. Yeah. So is the idea to be able to use a relatively small number of crystals to um, access many different elements? possibly going uh, uh, farther from backscatter? Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you probably, probably uh, need to, and as is a, an area detector uh, there, you need to um, move uh, crystals uh, with the uh, uh, pico motors, and then you are able to see different elements if if you have the crystal. See. Um, uh, what, uh, uh, what detector are you using here? Is it a Pilatus or, a, a, or what? In the image is a Pilatus, but uh, was the, uh, when the commission in there, uh, but uh, we think to use the same that I show you for um, X-ray diffraction. It's a Pi Mega detector. It's a based on Medipix 3 and have uh -huh. a, more or less uh, silicon uh, of 50 microns already. And the reason I was asking is uh, uh, concerning the ability to reject background. Um, uh, uh, so the Metapix, am I right? It has some ability to, uh, to window the individual photon events that's better than on the Pilatus, is that right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, that'll that'll of course be uh, uh, of course be important. Um, what spot size uh, did you find you had to use with the uh, von Hamo spectrometer to hold good energy resolution? Um, well, that uh, I I think uh, that I I don't have the response of that for you. <laughs> But uh, I, th I think uh, they compare uh, the resolution with something that I measured yet at the um, uh, Super Shas beamline, and uh -huh. it's quite uh, similar. Good. With the Medipix. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, uh -huh. that, I think that, that was the things that uh, Frederico done uh, at the moment. Uh, Okay. And it's a comparison of uh, see if we could reach the resolution that uh, are reported. I see. Okay, very good. Um, you mentioned the software development to, um, to be able to handle the very fast flow of data. I was curious, uh, this is something I don't know much about. Um, is there a, a consortium effort between uh, different synchrotrons to try to make a shared software for that purpose? Well, that software, it's open. It's, uh, uh -huh. in fact, uh, Carmelo uh, give uh, a, a Git, GitHub page. And if oh, I you see. found on Google, that, that's the link there. Okay. But uh, it's downloadable and you could do whatever. <laughs> in, in fact, if we think and improve it, uh, it's something that uh, I think, uh, I don't know, but I believe that uh, Matt New will use uh, uh, some some part of that for develop uh, um, the software that he done um, large. I think so. And some libraries and some uh, things that uh, Carmelo ha has done, I think, uh, are able to use it. And I think uh, there is not uh, 
a consortium for do that, but uh, I think that there is a lot of interest. Yes. And there are many, many people that uh, work on that. Uh, I, I know that people from Germany, um, Oliver Mueller, and, and people that are, uh, join uh, with FRAM, also a group, uh, they, they do, I, I think, a T-Rex or something like that that uh, is also open and download. I think uh, the people from SLS do something. And, well, Matt uh, do. And I think it will be a huge problem because it will be a large amount of data and we need something for uh, attack that. It's uh, it's uh... Uh, it's a wonderful challenge for the community to be in this situation where we have this uh, this flood of data um, uh, on uh, very important studies. Uh, yeah. Gian Antonio, you have a question? Can you unmute? Yeah, sure. It was a couple actually. Uh, first, I go, congratulations clearly, Santiago. Good to see things are working. Fantastic. Uh, regarding catalysis, I mean, uh, how do you handle the gases? I was curious. So. That's, you know, an infrastructure that's important. Uh, you have dust bottles in the hatches. You prefer to have them outside, uh, safety. We have a very, safe. very silly. And uh, perhaps I missed uh, the slides. Uh, what is your X-ray source? Ah, X-ray source. I think it was uh, commented uh, last talk on Sirius. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, missed that. But uh, uh, you could see on the web, I think, uh, for, for the journal club. And um, anyway, uh, for the gases, we have a strict uh, safety rules, and then we need to follow. And um, they decide to put uh, all the gases outside of the experimental hatch, and in a, for uh, divide the gases that are. Um, inflammable from the gases that are oxidant. And then uh, we have a, um, a cabinet for the gases that um, um, have extraction of the air and have a retention of explosions if happen. <laughs> and then we bring the lines inside to uh, the experimental hatch and we put uh, uh, regulators of pressure there and then we follow the lines to the um, to the focal position or the position that we we have inside and then we decide to use um, um, mass flow controllers from Bronkhorst and we have a lot of people that uh, work on steam reform and then we need to put uh, special things for them to use uh, liquids mixed with gases and this is something that uh, uh, bring us to uh, see solutions for uh, for that and if you are interested i could comment to you but uh, the main idea is to uh, put something uh, at the end of the ovens that uh, give you a back pressure regulator that uh, work in a closed cycle to maintain the pressure and the flow if you want. Then you, we could regulate the pressure and flow simultaneously. It's something that is uh, an industrial application that, uh, that comments to us and we we try to implement on, on the beam line. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, yeah. Something we would like to discuss with you. Thanks. Thank you. One last quick question, Santiago. Um, what's the maximum number of samples you'll be able to measure for extended XAFs in the automated setup? Well, this is something that we, we have not defined it yet. We, we have a, a, a up to now, 60, we, we are able to measure. But uh, uh, we think that we, that was uh, in, the, 
in the old machine. And right now, uh, at the time uh, that we could reach, probably we could measure m much more than that. In fact, we are thinking in, in reduce the size of the sample because we have a very little beam as well. And then uh, we could use uh, instead of 1.3 uh, centimeters uh, pellet, mm -hmm. like uh, five millimeters, and put uh, like 2,000, 3,000 samples uh, in at the same time. It'd be fascinating to think about how this can impact, say, uh, soil science research by allowing uh, very, very detailed spatial mapping of, uh, of, uh, of geochemistry. Um, given, the, uh, given the time, uh, I think we should move on to the second part of the presentation. But thank you. This is going to be a fantastic beamline. And uh, there's more questions for you in the chat um, that uh, uh, you should uh, uh, answer when you have the opportunity. I have a look. Okay, very good. Tulio is here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's here. Okay. You should unmute when you have a moment. Okay. Very good. Well, we switch gears now to soft X-rays. And first of all, I'd like to thank the opportunity to present the beamline here. It's a, it's a nice uh, audience, and I think we might have a very nice discussion. I have followed some of the talks in the series. I saw that there's a lot of interaction. It's Quite nice opportunity. Um, the beam line is called IP, and it's a high resolution soft X ray uh, spectroscopy beam line. Uh, IP stands for in, uh, inelastic scattering and photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, but it's also the name of a beautiful tree you have here in Brazil. These are some pictures of the tree here. It has some different colors and it's flourish this time of the year. So if you go around here in Brazil, in front of my house, there's a nice, beautiful yellow IP here. Um, and the beamline is dedicated to high resolution soft X-ray spectroscopy. And we have two branches. One of them is dedicated to photoelectron spectroscopy. And the second branch is, is dedicated to resonant and elastic X-ray scattering. And the main goal is to study the electronic structure and low energy excitations in both solids and molecules. Okay, uh, before describing the beamline, uh, I would like to give some uh, background on RICS. So I will talk mostly about RICS. I think it's more interesting for the community here than for the mission. And I'll give just some background before uh, describing the beamline because then you can understand better the, the challenges and the, and the solutions we, we, we got. So the, 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 the thing in RICS is to measure these low energy excitations in solids and molecules. These are the uh, excitations that propagate, for instance, when you disturb the material. Uh, most of the properties of solids comes from this, the propagation of these excitations after you, you create a disturbance in this, this uh, excitations propagate and you can measure a macroscopic response as a function of that. So these uh, elementary excitations are the well-known uh, collective excitations like phonon, plasmons, magnons, or also quasi-particles that this many body interacting particles that behave as a, as a single particle. There are many tools to measure uh, excitations, the inelastic scattering tools, uh, based on electrons, uh, low, uh, light scattering, random breed one, neutron scattering, and uh, photon correlation spectroscopy as well. And RICS is one more of these tools. It's very interesting because of the energy range that you have some interesting excitations here and also the momentum range that you can reach 
that matches more or less the Brillouin zone of most crystals. So that's why Rix attracts a lot of interest for this community that measures uh, low energy excitations. And the, the way we measure these excitations is uh, in an inelastic scattering is that you transfer energy to the material. So this is a total energy diagram to explain the process. First, we absorb a photon and you bring your system from the ground state to an intermediate state. In the intermediate state, we have a core excitation. You promote a core electron to an unoccupied state above the Fermi level. And in the second process, you emit a photon but you leave the system in an excited state. So your final state has a uh, higher energy than the ground state, so you leave the system in an excited state. And these are the excitations. So you have access not only to electronic excitations, but also spin and lattice excitations as well. So this is a total energy. And you, all, you can also transfer momentum. So it conserves momentum. And to do this, you just need to measure at different configurations at different angles between the incident and uh, scattered radiation. Then you can control the momentum transfer. And what you can do with that is to map the dispersion of the excitations. So here in this plot, uh, this is the intensity as function of the energy loss. This is the difference between the incident and the scattered uh, radiation. And you have these peaks here, these are uh, representing the excitation. So you deposit the energy on the sample. And what you can do is to measure a spectrum like this for different angles. And then you can map the dispersions of this excitation. This gives a lot of information about how you transport energy, how fast this uh, excitation is moving the material. So this just uh, to give a brief overview, what we can do with RICS. Um, as I show from the peak positions, you get the energy. You can have information about the couplings between the different excitations. You analyze the shape of these peaks. From the dispersion, you have bend velocity and effective masses. You can also analyze angular momentum. Using the selection rule, you have the uh, or, uh, orbital momentum. And if you analyze the polarization, you can have um, analyze the spin of the excitations. And similar to other core level uh, spectroscopy, you have selectivity to the element and state. And also, RIX is also interesting for fingerprinting. I think most applications, it's really related to fundamental studies. But uh, RIX has a nice potential for fingerprinting because uh, you can achieve a good spectral separation by tuning the photon energy. So you can, sometimes you can separate very well some spectral signatures uh, that are overlap, for instance, in absorption spectroscopy. And you can also have extra sensitivity to uh, exploiting the resonant enhancement. So you can enhance minority species, for instance, when you are probing some um, dynamics or some reactions or anything. But uh, it's well known that the, you have uh, very low counts because RIX is a second order process, but it's also uh, bulk sensitive because it's a photon in, photon out, uh, what's different from uh, photoemission spectroscopy. Um, I'll show an example here that I took from the literature. This is from uh, a paper from the ALS, from the IRIX and station. Here's the reference here. I like this. Uh, it's very illustrative to, to, to see the combination of uh, X-ray emission, absorption, and, and the RICs. So here is uh, X-ray emission spectrum of this material here. It's a complex oxide, uh, battery cathode, well known. So in this spectrum here, we have um, uh, several emission lines, oxygen, valence to core, and the transition metals, we have some uh, valence uh, core to core emissions, the 3S to 2P, and also the 3D to 2P valence to core emissions. Here's the X-ray absorption in the manganese LH. So 
what I want to show you now, it's a, a emission map where you measure the X-ray emission spectrum for each energy across the manganese L edge. So this is what you get when you measure this map. So uh, the emission energy is in the uh, horizontal scale, vertical scale is the incident energy and the color scale is the intensity. In these maps, the vertical lines are the fluorescence lines, same as we see here in the emission spectrum. We have this uh, diagonal line here with a slope of one. This is the elastic scattering. And what we are interested in RICs are these small things that appear between the fluorescence and the elastic line. So these lines that run parallel to the elastic lines, these are the inelastic uh, processes. So they come from different final states. So we have final states with excitations and they run parallel to the elastic line. So it's just uh, you have the same slope, but uh, they are translated vertical, uh, vertically here. So these are the things that we are interested to measure. Okay? And the main thing is that we need very high resolution to resolve the small features. There's a lot of information here in between. And you can see that they show up only when you are in resonance. So this is the position for the manganese L3 and L2. And you see that these things light up only when you are in resonance. Okay. So here's another, a better view of this uh, process. This is the elastic line, the uh, excitations line here, and this is the fluorescence line. And we want to resolve this. So to do that, uh, our instrument, we need two things. We need to prepare very well the incident photons, select very well the energy, momentum, and spin polarization of the incident radiation. This is the job of the source of the beam and the beam line. And also we need to measure very well the energy, momentum, and spin of the outcoming radiation. The, the differences will be what uh, you transfer to the excitations, right? And the more, the lower the energy that you are interested, the higher should be your resolution, both in the beam line and the spectrometer. So the source in the beam line, it's, uh, you need high flux, high resolution, polarization control, and also a small spot. So RICS is really photon hungry. It's, you, it's, it re, that's why I think the technique is re, will really flourish in this um, uh, low emittance rings because it's really demanding on the, on the source. Uh, for the spectrometer, we also need high resolution, acceptance as high as possible because it's a uh, uh, low intensity process. You need very good 2D detectors with low noise and if you can, a polarizer to analyze the polarization of the emitted radiation as well. And to complement this experiment, you need, you need to control your your system, right? You need the well, your system in a well-defined state. Uh, you need rotations to control the momentum transfer, translations to uh, scan your sample, and also sample environments that allow you to control uh, temperature, pressure, electric field, magnetic fields, to control the phases of the material that you want to analyze. So these are the, the challenges that uh, motivated our study. And depending on the resolution, depending on the, ex, the, the, the energy of the excitations you want to probe, and, this, and, and you, then you have to make choices for the beamline and spectrometer. So in our case, our target was 25 milli electron volts at 900 electron volts in the copper L edge. So this is the overview now of the beam line, what the choices we did. So it's a delta undulator beam line, uh, a source. Uh, the beam line is mostly a collimated plane grating monochromator. So we collimate the light, we disperse in a plane grating and we focus with a focusing mirror at the exit slit. So at this point here we have a 
focus it and disperse the beam, and we just image the we demagnify the exit slit at the uh, experimental station here using the, an, an ellipsoidal mirror. As you can see here, the the monochromator it's more or less at uh, one to one demagnification to the exit slit, so we are not demagnifying the source. So this is um, and this minimizes a lot optical aberration. So we, you might have a very small beam and very round beam. So um, because aberrations distort a lot of the line shape in rigs, and it might gives us a tail that hinders some excitation when you go very close to the elastic line. So we, we took very care to minimize aberrations as much as possible. Um, just to give you some um, uh, numbers about the performance, this is the simulated performance. We use analytical simulation, ray tracing, and wavefront propagation. So we can achieve 14 ele electron volts at 900. Uh, this is the spot size at the sample, so it's below one micro in the vertical and around three micro in the horizontal. The grating gives us uh, uh, a transmission of 4%. This is the transmission of the whole beam line, 4% and 900 electron volts. And here is just how the beam shape, uh, beam size changes as function of energy. Uh, this is an overview of the beam line. Uh, the mechanics of the first mirror and the monochromator is a commercial from Bestec, and the other mirrors, the focusing and the refocusing mirrors, are in house developments. Uh, this is an overview of our standard mirror chambers that's used for all the beam lines on Sirius. So it's, we have uh, five degrees of freedom on the base. This is a granite base and two degrees of freedom internally. And our um, mirrors are just in the assembly line in front of the hatch, just waiting to be installed. Um, and now an overview of our spectrometer. So um, the idea is that we use a slitless flat field spectrometer. It's more or less um, six meters in size. If you want to see more details, you can look for this paper here. It was presented in the synchronization instrumentation um, conference in 2018. So the optical layout is quite simple. It's, the, it's um, based on the, on the spectrometer from the SLS called SACCESS. It's a sing, single optical element. It's a, cylindrical grating that has the double function to, to collect the radiation, disperse and focus on the detector. The detector is uh, CCD, very small um, point spread function of five microns. And we have a very good quality um, grating with less than 100 nanometers slope error. Uh, here's just to give an uh, idea on how the overall resolution depends on the length of the spectrometer. The bigger the spectrometer, the, 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 the better you get here, the lower the, the resolution here. We stopped around here at this point, six to seven meter, because it's when you start to become dominated by the slope and the detector. So we are not source limited anymore. And here is the simulation of the resolution we can achieve with this spectrometer at 900 electron volts. So we reached 20 milli electron volts at 900 in the simulations, and combining with the resolution of, of the beam line, we get something around 25 milli So this is more or less uh, below our target. It was 30 milli electron volts. This is just to show the transmission of the beam line. It's around, uh, of the spectrometer is around 10%, the grating efficiency. Um, the detector we purchased already, it's delivered uh, here at, uh, in Brazil, but 
Unfortunately, due to the COVID situation, we could not install and test the detector. This will be done uh, next year. The mechanics, it took us some time um, to project this, um, all this infrastructure because we wanted to minimize as much as possible the vibrations. So this might kill the, the resolution if everything vibrates. The, the detector has to be as, uh, as still as possible during the measurement. So we did extensive uh, finite element simulations to, to improve the, the mechanical design of the spectrometer. And our criteria was to have eigenfrequencies higher than 100 hertz and the first mode not in the dispersion plane. So if we cannot minimize, we move we make the, the spectrum to move in other directions and not in the dispersion direction. And this is the view of the spectrometer being assembled. We're just waiting the granite floor to be installed. And we will start with the metrology. We have also a very special chamber for the measurements because you need to uh, uh, change the angles in vacuum. So we need to rotate the spectrometer around the sample, keeping vacuum all the time, ultra high vacuum all the time. So we purchased this chamber from the, a company in Sweden called Engelund. This is also used at uh, Max 4, it's the same chamber. And it allows us to rotate the spectrometer, keeping the vacuum uh, and the sample in the same position. So very nice uh, chamber that allows you more or less 120 degrees and it has a very small volume that helps a lot as well. And this is an overview of the spectrometer and things we could do. So we have a working range of 400 to 1200 electron volts. So we can cover the first row transition metal L edges, oxygen and nitrogen K edges, uh, combined resolution of 30 milli electron volts at 900, continuous rotation of the spectrometer around the sample by 120 degrees. We are working on the sample environments. So we have a standard sample environment for solids with a cryostat that reaches between 12 and 14 Kelv. Uh, it's a six degree of freedom with rotations and translations. We are working on a microfluidic cell as well for gases and liquids. And we also, we we will try to adapt a strain cell to do measurements under strain. And future upgrades will be a low energy grating to reach the carbon edge, um, phosphorus, L edge, and rare earth, earths, uh, liquid jet, and maybe a polarizer to analyze the polarization of the scattered radiation. And just to finish, this is just the overview of the science opportunities. Uh, I know Rex is. There's a strong focus in the community in condensed matter physics, but there's a lot of possibility also for material science and molecular physics as well. There are really nice uh, current results in the literature. And I would like to finish the presentation with some analogies to all the people that uh, helped during this uh, project. And I'll stay here for the discussions and questions. Thank you. That's a, 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 that a great description of the beamline. Um, I was curious, can you say anything more about uh, the choice of the uh, spectrometer layout? Uh, yeah. Were there other ideas you considered and why did you choose this layout? There are many ideas. Uh, we chose this layout basically because uh, it was the first uh, spectrometer that we designed. So I, I worked in other spectrometers and I, I wanted a spectrometer that could be as simple as possible to design, to install and commission. So we have first experiments as fast as possible. You could complicate a lot the spectrometer, putting collecting mirrors, putting an extra mirror to, uh, to tune the incident angle on the grating. There are many possibilities. And this has been for instance, in the NSLS, they, they constructed a very large complex spectrometer. 
but yeah. I didn't want to, to take the risk that uh, the complexity would uh, delay our first results. So we have a community that is really uh, want to, to, to use RICS. RICS was never measured here. And so we are all excited to do that. So that was basically the choice. Very good. What will be the um, standard abilities for controlling sample environment during the, the RICS measurements here? So the standard is a six degree of freedom uh, monochromator, or oh, monochromator, uh, manipulator. Yes. With a possibility of a cryostat. Uh -huh. And what we are working on right now is uh, a gas and liquid cell that we can insert in the same manipulation, manipulator, it's a flow cell. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to use a commercial cell that they sell for, uh, uh, transmission electron microscopes. So this has a lot of advantage. So you don't have to handle. It's a silicon nitride right. commercial cell. They're quite nice, works very well. And since we have a very small beam, uh, it can be suitable for us. So we are discussing already this with a company. Very good. Um, excuse me. Um, uh, any possibility of adding a magnetic field or does that not seem to be uh, either possible or of interest? No, it's, there's a high interest to do that. We, uh, there, I have a colleague who is trying to think about, the question is how to reach high magnetic fields inside, but we are thinking about all the possible possibilities. It's yes, challenging. Very, 